And in reading about you, I learned that you came from very humble beginnings. And I think this is a really interesting story. You weren't even going to go to college. You weren't sure if you were going to go to college at one point. And you were in a growing up in a neighborhood that wasn't the safest. Tell us about your background. So uh, born and raised here in the city of Chicago. My dad is from Puerto Rico and my mom is from Ecuador. So um, my mom immigrated here. Uh, so I'm first generation. Uh, that's, this is where they met and this is where I've been raised. Um, lived here up until the age of about nine years, of, uh, nine years old. The uh, community that we lived in uh, wasn't, as you mentioned, the safest or the, the greatest at that point in time. It's hilarious because I look back now and the property values in those communities now are just kind of booming. So um, it's just funny how the real estate market changes over the, the years. But uh, my parents, uh, and, and it depends on whose version of the story you hear, if you hear my grandparents, if you hear my dad's, or you hear my mom's, uh, is basically I just woke up one morning, I was put on a plane, and I was sent to Puerto Rico to live with my paternal grandparents. Uh, and I think it was my parents' way of getting me out of the neighborhood because we couldn't really afford to move out of the neighborhood at that point. But uh, the, the Puerto Rican community has always been very close, and uh, it's not uncommon to raise other people's children for a period of time. So my grandparents raised me for uh, a little bit over two years. I was sent to Puerto Rico, didn't have, uh, uh, wasn't able to come back and visit my parents for that time. But when they were able to actually purchase some property and move a little bit further north in the city out of that community into what was then deemed a safer community, they, uh, they sent back for me. And it's a very rural upbringing. Um, you know, I, I, uh, I tease my kids nowadays because you always want to try and give your children a bit more than what your parents were able to give you. And uh, I've now become my father where I tell them and say, you know, you've no idea what it's like uh, when, you were, when, when I was growing up. And I refer back to those years when I was in Puerto Rico where I tell them, you know, I, I wore shoes to church and school only. Um, I walked to school for over 45 minutes and back. And, and they can't fathom the thought of that, so it's kind of fun. <laughs> That's great. Wow. And so when you're growing up in, in, in these different communities, both in Puerto Rico and then back in Chicago, where a lot of people aren't going to college, what led to you making the decision to ultimately go to college and even to law school? Um, you know, I've, uh, as you can tell from my career, um, and, and because there hasn't really been too many role models uh, at, uh, within my, my inner family circle, those that have gone to college and beyond, um, I do have an aunt who had actually gone to, to, to college, but my parents weren't so lucky. My older brothers uh, didn't, didn't follow that path either. They actually joined the military. <coughs> Excuse me. So when I eventually graduated from high school, there was no plan for me to go to college. In fact, I remember there were a couple of friends in high school. We were all very close. And uh, it may have been a couple of months before graduation when finally they began to say, oh, we're going over to the local community college that we had there to register for classes. And I literally just tagged along to see what the process was like. And it's there where I discovered, you know, what the admissions process was like and what, you know, each per credit hour was like and so on. And then just jumped on the bandwagon and did that. And that was my first year out of high school. I went to a college that was literally within a mile away from my high school um, and spent my first year of college there. And I eventually transferred over. So that was Northeastern Illinois University. I was there for a year, and then I transferred over to Loyola University uh, here in Chicago, which is where I uh, majored in both sociology and communications. But uh, college wasn't something that was in the plan or in the books. My parents couldn't afford to do it. They were very clear about that. Um, but I was able to get some scholarships and some, uh, some federal grants and somehow uh, made it through. That's excellent. That's really great. And do you have advice to people that are in similar uh, situation from a similar upbringing on whether they should go and how they should make that happen? Oh, I think nowadays it's common knowledge, and everyone always hears it is a college diploma uh, is you know somewhat similar to what a high school diploma may have been back in the '60s, or you know, and so on. But it's it's a necessity. It's something that I think individuals should pursue, especially when you don't know what you want to do. I know that some say college isn't for everyone, uh, but I would always encourage someone to at least go for a semester or two and kind of get a sense and see if it's for you or not. Um, uh, otherwise, there's trade schools and there's all sorts of other places that individuals can pursue. Uh, uh, an education beyond uh, just high school. But I would strongly encourage college for everyone, again, especially if you don't necessarily know exactly what it is that you'd want to do when you grow up. Uh, some of us are still trying to figure that out. <laughs> right. I'm glad you're sharing that story because I think a lot of people take college and law school for granted. And so, you know, you, you show that you really had to fight for it. What about law school? What led you then to say, now I'm going to go an extra level? So the, the, uh, 
the strategy throughout college, because I hadn't done it before, because there weren't really any mentors or many people that I can turn to and say, what was your experience like? Again, the Northeastern experience was wonderful. Uh, I went through that, and then there was um, uh, an opportunity for me, again, to transfer over to Loyola and finish up there. Uh, and I basically took it a year at a time. Um, I never went into college saying, I'm going to graduate with a college degree. I went in saying, let me finish the semester. Let's see how I can do. Uh, and then, you know, once I did well in that semester, it's like, okay. So it was always kind of in semester and, and bite-sized chunks. So I never really kind of said, well, you know, four years from now, I see myself having a college degree and then moving on to a specific field. It was literally just, you know, let me do as well as I can this semester and, you know, uh, and enjoy the class and enjoy the experience. And then I would do the same thing for the next semester. And next thing I know, I was graduating. Uh, it was a similar experience after I graduated. Uh, I happened to be working at a law firm. It was my first job, uh, my first official job, uh, which I began working at the age of 15. And it wasn't until, um, so it was a few months before I turned 16, which back then was the legitimate age for working. So I had fibbed on my application. Uh, but by the time they found out that I wasn't 15, I had already turned 16, so they allowed me to remain. Uh, and it was for a local grocery store. So I did that my last two years in high school and my first two years in college up until an acquaintance of mine who was working at a law firm in downtown Chicago uh, turned to me and said, um, hey, Rich, they're looking for someone to fill in a couple of days that I can't work. Is there any way that your, your, your class schedule would allow you to work a couple of hours each day so that I can keep my job, meaning himself? And I said, sure. So I left the grocery store and I began to work downtown with a shirt and a tie at a law firm um, as an office clerk, I was the copy boy. I learned how and uh, to file things in all the courts. Uh, began to develop a great relationship with you know the uh, the individuals uh, in the chambers and the judges and so on. Just because I was there so frequently, I got lunch, I washed cars. I mean, you name it, and I did it all. Um, and it was the partners at those law firm uh, at, at that law firm that I worked with that uh, began to give me research assignments and began to give me kind of things that were above and beyond just your regular clerical office clerical duties. Uh, and I began to really enjoy it. I learned how to use Westlaw Lex, you know, and LexisNexis and all those things back then. Um, and then one day they turned to me and said, hey, Rich, have you ever thought about going to law school? And but for them having said that, I would have never thought of it on my own because it wasn't as if, again, I really knew any attorneys other than the ones that were just there in the office. So um, they're the ones that encouraged me to pursue uh, taking the LSAT. Uh, and that's where it all kind of started. But it was a great investment. I would uh, encourage and I still do encourage many individuals to go to law school. Inspirational story, isn't it? You guys can watch Rich describe the different roles he's had in government agencies and hear him talk about the interesting ways he's applied his law degree by going to jdcareersoutthere.com or jdcot.com for a shortcut. Once you're at the site, make sure you become a member so that you can get access to the full interview and access to lots more exclusive content filled with great advice. Thanks again for watching, everybody. I'm Mark Luber and look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.